thank you for inviting me to give a talk. It's an honor to speak at the 10th of your lectures. Um, as Claire said, I'm instrument scientist at the Instrument Reseda. It's a neutron resonant spin echo instrument at the research reactor in Munich. And uh, well, when I uh, applied for this position two years ago, it was like, okay, I knew a bit what neutron spin echo is. A lot of people probably do. It's something you can really find out easily. But I've never heard about this meter technique. And it was, uh, there was only scarce literature around which actually has gotten much better since then because we've been working really hard and so have some of our international colleagues. And uh, yeah, so I figured I introduced this technique a little bit and I will first tell you a bit about uh, what uh, a METSA setup looks like, how it's different from a normal a neutron spin echo setup. And then I will tell you about the science that you can do at Roseda. And since it's uh, very good to do uh, magnetic research there, I will give you three nice examples of some magnetic systems that we've studied. And with that, I will start sharing my screen with you. One second. There we go. And uh, you should see the slideshow now. So and since I've introduced what I'm going to say. I will skip the first uh, two slides and I'm skipping right ahead to uh, Rezeda here. So you can see here, uh, well, a nice picture of Rezeda with its two spectrometer arms, which I will explain in a minute. And down here you have the research reactor in Munich with a neutron guide hole here. And you can see Rezeda actually has a really nice end position and quite a lot of space. Here's the experimental hall, here's our reactor core, and next to it is the famous atom egg from Munich, which has actually become uh, the, uh, the uh, a sign on the, on the flag of Garching, the place next to Munich where the reactor is standing. So it's quite famous and it looks actually quite funny. So if you have time, you should Google that at some point. And uh, yeah, this is our setup. And for those people who are not that inter inter interested in instrumentation, I've... Uh, summed the, the instrument up using the 10 hundred most used words. Uh, if you haven't tried yet, try summing up your research on, using only these 10 hundred most used words. It's actually really, really funny. And uh, I'm going to now quickly explain Rosetta just using those words. So we have neutrons coming in. They come to a box that picks the tiny things based on how fast they go. Then we have things that flip the direction of the tiny things. We have things that make sure that we don't lose the tiny things on the way. We have a box that checks the direction of the tiny things. Then here the position of the things we want to study. We have a big air-free box here. And after that, we have a picture-taking box uh, right here at the back. Now, for those of you who want to uh, know in a bit more detail, you have to listen a bit more carefully now. Um, I'm going to start by first explaining a bit about the spin echo techniques just in case uh, you don't know them that well or you haven't actually heard of them. And I'm going to start with a classical neutron spin echo. It's actually quite a neat technique and uh, you'd think, oh, it doesn't consist of so many parts, so it's quite simple. But uh, in reality, it's a bit more difficult than that. Uh, we have a polarizer, so we're working with polarized neutrons. And uh, then we have a pi half flipper. And then we have the neutrons that go into a big, big solenoid. And there they do a lot more precession. So it's like a tiny clock winding up the neutron, right? So it gathers phase and it rotates, it rotates, it rotates. And uh, then there's the sample. And then we have the same big solenoid, but the, instead of, and, but we would have actually the field pointing in the opposite direction. So we wind down the clock again, so that if we have no sample at all, at the detector we detect the exact same neutron as left here through the polarized. But since it's actually uh, a bit more complicated to have the field pointing in the opposite direction, we do instead a pi flip of the neutrons and uh, have therefore the polarization in the other direction. But the principle is the same. So if the neutron now interacts with the sample, it will move a bit faster, so it will spend, or slower, so it will spend a different amount of time in the second solenoid, so it will have a different, num a different phase or a different number of rotation when it comes to the detector. And uh, that is actually then what is measured, the uh, polarization is called. So how different is, or how many neutrons are different from when they came in. 
Now, it's a really nice technique. Uh, it has it, some limitations. For example, it, uh, the spin echo time that you can reach, so it's the, basically the time scale on which the dynamics you can observe here, is uh, directly proportional to the field integral. And field integral is just the field strength times the length of the coil. So if you want to go to really, really high times, you will have to make your coil either really, really long or your magnet magnetic field really, really high. And at some point that becomes a bit difficult. So, but people have been figuring out how to trick this a little bit. On the other hand, if you want to go to really short times, I mean, you can imagine if you have a polarized neutron and you have usually some guide fields, so you don't depolarize, but then if your field becomes so, so low that the uh, a uh, neutron beam might lose its polarization. This is where your lower limit is, right? You cannot go to smaller field integrals. It's just not possible. And uh, so people were then thinking, okay, these big solenoids, it could be problematic. So why don't we do that with a resonant spin flip using uh, radio frequency flippers? And that was done. And that's actually a quite interesting setup as well. So these big solenoids are replaced by RF flippers here. And uh, first, uh, the first uh, resonance neutron spin echo setup was actually in a transverse uh, geometry. So the classical spin echo is longitudinal. You can see here the spins of the neutrons are along the flight path, the, these little red arrows, while here they're actually perpendicular to the flight path. Now, this is, has a small problematic coming with it. That means that you have to put your entire setup into a nice mu metal box so that external magnetic fields don't disturb your neutrons and don't depolarize your beam. So that makes, uh, well, it makes your setup a bit more bulky and it's a bit more uh, difficult to work with. It's still, um, the set, this technique is actually used nowadays mostly in a triple axis configuration where you can use it to do phonon focusing and where you can uh, get a really high energy as a resolution, even higher than you would get uh, in a normal uh, in a normal triple axis setup. Now, people are thinking, okay, so we have some disadvantages here, some disadvantages there. Why don't we take the best of both and put them together? So that's how they came up with the longitudinal neutron resonance spin echo. So here we have again the polarization of the neutron along the flight path. We have these resonant spin flippers. And you can see here, we have now here a small solenoid here in between. And you think, okay, but if we have the spin flippers, why do we have the solenoid? And this solenoid is actually a really clever thing because with this solenoid, we're actually applying a negative field integral. So we're subtracting field integral from the field that we're producing here, which means we can actually reach lower spin echo times than we could with the classical spin echo or the transverse uh, resonance spin echo. So this actually gives us a bit more flexibility to go to faster dynamics and to low spin echo times. So this is actually quite a, quite a nice uh, thing. Now, one thing that is a bit tricky to do with spin echo setups, as you can maybe imagine, is uh, so if I have like a polarized neutron beam here and uh, we're measuring the polarization in the end and we're putting a magnetic field or magnetic sample here. This will depolarize our beam and we will lose some information. And that is uh, that's something, of course, that you don't want. You can, there's some tricks and some uh, ways on which you can measure with magnetic samples on a neutron spin echo, but usually you're sacrificing some flux for that. And that is actually something you really don't want to do because the very cool thing about the spin echo is that the resolution is not limited or not coupled back to your flux at all. So you know that for some setups you use a monochromator, so you have to have a really monochromatic beam and that usually since you're neutron source doesn't give you like a, it gives you of course a spectrum of neutrons, not just one wavelength. It means you're throwing away a lot of neutrons, but for neutron spin echo, you can use a wavelength distribution. So usually you would have a wavelength selector and at Reseda we actually use plus minus 12.5%, which gives us a lot more flux. So flux is really not something you want to sacrifice because that's something of the really strong points of this method. So, that was the beginning, the birth of the Mietze technique. Mietze actually means modulation of intensity with zero effort, which sounds a bit complicated, but uh, I will tell you in a second where this name comes from and then it makes actually quite some sense. So you can see the setup. The first part actually looks exactly the same as for the neutron resonance spin echo, 
But then we have, instead of the pi flipper, we have a pi half flipper and we have this analyzer here. And what the analyzer does, it takes our um, neutron angle, so the rotation of the neutron, and it translates it into an intensity modulation. And after that, we have our sample and then nothing and the detector. So we do all the spin manipulation before the sample, which means that the sample, we can have magnetic fields, we can have a magnetic sample, we can have uh, incoherently scattering samples. It's all doesn't matter because we did all our spin manipulations already and we're not touching the beam anymore. And uh, here I have a few pictures of some examples of these uh, different machines. We have the classical neutron spin echo where we have one that is operated by our partners uh, the, uh, in Jülich, uh, the JNSE at the MLZ. They have, it's actually quite a cool setup because they use this big uh, superconducting coils here instead of just normal solenoids. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. Then uh, the transverse uh, neutron resonance spin echo, an example for that is actually the older Zeta. This is a rather old picture. And uh, you can see here that we have around all the setup, we have this big metal box. And this, um, this is our mu metal shielding. But since, uh, well, this was never operating quite well at Reseda, now actually the, there have been some people who have managed to run the, res, the transverse version of the resonance spin echo rather well, but at Reseda this never quite worked, so we it was transformed into a longitudinal neutron resonance spin echo. And you can see it looks pretty cool, and uh, it's very nicely working. And uh, we have here still two arms, but instead of having like, we have a resonant spin echo arm and we have a Mitsa arm. And if you want to see this in a bit more detail, here's comparison still the very simple view of Reseda. Uh, we have, as I said, a velocity selector and a polarizer and then our flippers and the, that we then only use for Mitsa, the uh, transmission bender, which is our analyzer. And we can either use the, uh, the Mitsa arm or the NRSE arm. And what's actually really neat is that it takes us maybe five minutes or so to switch from one setup to the other, because basically all we need to do is to put in or remove the transmission bender and change the flipper here. So it's a very versatile setup, which is, um, well, it's really cool actually. So, and uh, before I now tell you a bit more about the science, I give you quickly a pro and con between the NRSE and Mitsa, because you might think, okay, um, why do we have two arms? I mean, there's you need a whole lot of space with that. Is it really worth it? And we actually think, yes, it is, because the NRC is similar to conventional spin echo, it, but with a smaller detector area for us. And it has a very high resolution, and it, has, it can go to rather high momentum transfers. But we have no external magnetic field, magnetic samples are difficult and strongly incoherent scattering samples also reduce the polarization. So usually you would you deteriorate your sample, which sometimes you just don't want to. On the other hand, the MITSA setup is uh, similar to a high resolution time of flight uh, technique actually. We can have magnetic fields, we can have paramagnetic superconducting samples, we can have incoherently scattering samples, like for example, pure water, like really water, H2O, not D2O, like most neutron beam lines measure, but the actual H2O. Um, on the other hand, we pay for that with a bit of a reduced resolution in comparison to the neutron spin echo and with a uh, very bit limited in momentum transfer. So you see that there's there are basically really two different science cases. So it's really good to have them both, even though we do need a lot of space for them. Now I'm coming to the science uh, that we do at Reseda. I'll give you three really nice examples. And um, the first example is uh, one of our previous uh, PhD students, Stefan Seubert, um, was working on that. And that is fluctuations at the Curie point in iron. Now iron is a, well, it's, just, it's a ferromagnet, right? Everyone knows iron. It's a, it's rather, well, it's a well-known system, but uh, it's still there's still a lot of interesting stuff to study here. So we wanted to study the fluctuations at above and below the Curie point. And first of all, we need to find the Curie point because you know all samples is a bit different, and you want to be sure you're smack on. And for that, we do the we'll we search for a peak in the critical scattering, which you can see here. 
or we look at the transmission of the sample and there we have actually this uh, critical opalescence at the Curie temperature. And this is how we define the Curie temperature and then we're measuring and uh, we're starting above. So this is a measurement that's uh, 10 Kelvin above the critical temperature. And you can see here what we measure at Reseda, where we have this S of Q and tau, which is actually the intermediate scattering function. And not as you measure with a lot of other neutron uh, scattering setups, S of Q and energy, as I have uh, put here, because it's more familiar for most people, um, versus the mean seed time. Now we have here just an exponential decay. We can fit this with a and get a line width. And uh, that actually corresponds into the line width of this peak here. And we can see as we approach the phase transition, this peak gets sharper. And uh, there's actually a critical slowing down as we approach the phase transition. And this is because uh, close to TC, we have bigger patches that actually fluctuate. And these bigger patches have longer lifetimes. So there's this critical slowing down as we approach TC. Now, if we go below DC, you can see uh, TC, you can see that this uh, Laurentian that we had before um, is actually, well, it's kind of this broad thing where you can, you, know, you can see that there's like two peaks here and the energy of the peak is not zero anymore. So we're now at an inelastic signal. And an inelastic signal in a meets uh, signal uh, gives us an oscillation on our exponential decay, rather just an, uh, an oscillation here. And uh, we can see that the uh, period actually goes down as the temperature goes down or you know the period goes up as we get closer to tc because the phonon uh, the magnons actually soften as we approach tc and uh, there is actually they evolve towards this quasi elastic peak that we get above tc or rather at tc now for the data uh, you can see here everything actually is still nicely summed up i actually really like the colors in this plot um, if we now look at the line widths above TC and uh, we fit, we can see that uh, actually at TC, they fit rather nicely with this quadratic behavior. And this is here plotted together with data that has been taken by Mese before. And we can see that actually the Zeta data and this data, they fit together really nicely. But you can see that if we go above TC, this quadratic behavior is not really given anymore. And we have here a, a minimum at a finite Q and it goes up here again. And this is actually an indication for dipolar interactions to become important. And these dipolar actually interactions give us here an additional dampening at small Q. And that is, well, it's a really cool thing to find out, right? And it's a really nice study. Now the next project is a project that's still ongoing. It's by our PhD student, Andreas Wendel. And it's on the spin dynamics in holmium titanate. The holmium titanate is one of these perovskite oxides with these really complicated structures. You have like in your unit cell alone, you have 88 atoms. And you have a, you have a ground state that uh, actually the free ion ground state of the holmium actually splits up into 10 states. So there's a rather complex system. And, uh, but we have a really large gap between the ground state and the excited state, which mean, which uh, allows us to describe the ground state actually by the spin-eyes the spin model. And so this is a really interesting model to study and it's really interesting to see what kind of dynamics do we see here. And uh, first of all, there was, uh, Andreas did some measurements which were like just at zero field then at like room temperature down to about 50 kelvins and later on a bit lower down. So first of all, we wanted to see, okay, can we measure this? It is it, does it scatter well? What do we see? And you can see, we do actually see quite a lot. We have here a decay, we have some oscillations and we can describe this with this rather complicated formula, but since this is a bit much, I'm gonna split this apart. So we have a quasi-elastic part, which in the energy space can be described by a Laurentian again. And then we have an inelastic part where we have this oscillation, which gives us this uh, double peak with a finite energy again in the energy space. Now the inelastic, if you look at the inelastic, we can see that actually if we go lower in temperature, this gets the contribution of this gets less and less. And uh, 
actually for the measurements that are even below this temperature which are not shown here you can see that this oscillation is completely gone so this is actually this indicates that this is actually a transition between two excited states and in this case with comparing the energies with what has been done previously in literature and so forth you could actually see that this is a transition between the second excited doublet and the second excited singlet now if you want to take a closer look at the quasi-elastic we can see, okay, we have a broadening with temperature. Now let's have a closer look at this, right? So we're physicists, we like to fit stuff uh, with temperature with an Arrhenius model, right? Everyone has done a fit of an Arrhenius model before. It's just something that we really like to do. But you can see here that if we take an Arrhenius model with like an energy for this of 25.5 MeV, you can see that this doesn't quite fit anymore. And you can actually see that in this graph, there's a uh, data points from this work, but also measurements that have been done before at other spin echo setups or even as a time of flight setup. And you can see the data, first of all, they coincide really nicely and the Arrhenius model does not fit at all. So Rumini actually pointed out that it would be worth trying this with an Orbach model, which the Orbach model actually describes a magnetoelastic coupling between phonons and a crystal field states. So basically phonons are uh, help uh, ex going from the ground to the, ground to the excited states and then uh, after that excitation the the energy the, the phonon definitely decays immediately again and emits another phonon so it's actually quite uh, it's quite an interesting phenomenon that is happening here and uh, yeah we're quite excited to see what, continue, what uh, goes on if we take this to lower temperatures or higher magnetic fields and what will go on there now the next uh, thing i'm going to present here is work done by jonas kindervater and a lot of uh, other collaborations at the physics department in munich and uh, it's about the manganese silicon which is like one of our workhorse materials at the physics department uh, for those of you who don't know it as well, it has quite a rich magnetic uh, uh, magnetic phase diagram. You have a field polarized phase, a conical phase, a helical phase, paramagnetic phase, and then you have here this tiny pocket, which is our skirmion lattice. And this is actually a really cool magnetic state, and it's really fascinating. I mean, you can see here, this is like this weird uh, vortexy spin structure. It's actually pretty cool. And uh, what was studied here was how does the phase transition happen from this paramagnetic phase into this skirmion lattice? And uh, yeah, this is what I just said. And uh, for this, neutrons are actually a really good uh, a good tool to measure. And first of all, they, uh, they started with some sun's measurements. And if you put the skirmion lattice into sun's, uh, and you put the magnetic field along the neutron direction, you get this really cool six-fold pattern. I mean, it looks really, it looks really pretty actually. And you can, you have to take a care here for the temperature because you have seen that this skirmion pocket is quite small. So the temperature range in which this happens is actually quite small. So if you hear 28.7 Kelvin, and if you now look at this, how does this look in the paramagnetic phase? We see we just have a really dilute. Uh, Diffuse, diffuse uh, scattered ring here, and this is only 30.5 uh, Kelvin, right? So this is not even two Kelvin higher. Now, if you look in between, you can see that there's there's still some higher intensity here where the six-fold pattern was, but there's also some increased intensity here in between. So this was a pretty cool thing uh, to figure out, and now the question is. Is this static or is this dynamic? And this is where Rizeta comes in. And uh, we can see the skirmions as well at Rizeta. Our detector is not quite as big and not quite as far away. So we don't see as many skirmions on the screen as you would see at the suns, but still. And we can measure the dynamics of the skirmions. So we set, we evaluated the data here in the spot where you can see the, in this of the six pole pattern and uh, we measured at different temperatures. And you can see uh, in the skirmion phase, this is very static, so there's no decay or nothing. And when the temperature is increased, there's this decay. And you can see that for this intermediate phase that we saw in SANS before, that there's an exponential decay and we can associate this with a lifetime. 
So there's fluctuations that have a lifetime around one nanosecond, which, uh, well, it's cool. No one knew this before, right? So we learned something about how this skirmion lattice actually crystallizes in and from the paramagnetic phase. And I used the word crystallize because it's actually very similar to how ice crystallizes crystallizes in water right if you have water and you freeze it and then you have first like some ice crystals appearing here and they're melting again and appearing here and melting again and this is actually a surprisingly similar uh, mechanism and I think with this my time is almost over I will take some time still to thank everyone who did this research since uh, I'm presented the research that has done at the instrument where I'm an instrument scientist, but has of course been done with a lot of other people together. We have uh, my uh, co-responsible Christian and then our previous postdoc Olaf and our current uh, postdocs John, who are working uh, quite hard with us together and our technician Christian, who helps us keep Rosetta running. And then the professors at the physics department, Peter Bruni and Christian Fleider, who keep providing us with nice new science cases. And then some students who have been working with us, Franz, Steffen, Leonie, and Andreas. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. And as Claire said, there is now a question and answer uh, session. You can, uh, in your Zoom meeting, you can click the Q&A button and ask a question there. And if you, Think of a question later on you can uh, just email me my email address is here and yeah with that uh, that was everything for me and i thank you for your attention again <laughs>